In episode 140 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet with Mike Adams and discuss his book, Food Forensics. You can find the show notes for this episode at older.fitness forward slash 140. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. I'm pretty excited to be bringing you Mike Adams today because he's really a fascinating guy. And I really like that I get the opportunity to read all of these books, meet with all of these great, great authors, and learn so much from them. Now, beyond the podcast, there's a way that you can benefit from all of the life lessons, all the book lessons, all the things that I've learned, and that's by becoming a client. Go to forever.fitness forward slash different and find out how you can train me to be a personal trainer. I'd love to be your coach on your health and fitness journey. Mike Adams, known as the Health Ranger, is an outspoken consumer health advocate, award-winning investigative journalist, internet activist, and science lab director. He is the founder and editor of naturalnews.com, the internet's most trafficked natural health news website. He is also the creator of counterthink.com, foodinvestigations.com, healingfoodreference.com, honestfoodguide.org, and several other websites covering natural health topics. He's a really cool guy. They've got a lab. They test the food to know what's in it. So I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So Mike, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Well, thank you, Alan. I really appreciate being on. It's great to join you. I'm really excited to talk to you today because some of the things that you brought up in the book, they're, they're very scary, but they're right in my face. You know, they're right there every single day. And, you know, I, I was kidding with you before we kind of got on this. I, I wish, almost wish I hadn't read your book because being blissfully ignorant made me feel a lot better about life. But there's a lot of good information in the book that these poisons, these toxins, are right in our food and they're right in our face every single day. And, you know, again, the, the practical aspect of it, what is it? But then how do we how do we deal with it? And all that was covered in the book. And I just kind of really appreciate that style and what, what it's given us. It's practical as well as informational. Well, well, uh, thank you for your feedback. And I got to say, you know, 40 plus fitness being your your domain, we all know those of us who are over 40 know that when you're in your 20s, you can kind of eat almost anything and you still feel pretty energetic, right? <laughs> because you've got that youthful momentum going for you. But when you get into your 30s and especially past your 40s or 50s, nutrition matters so much and avoiding the toxins matters so much that if you don't know what you're eating, then you're never going to be able to stay fit and healthy as you age. So it's really key at this point in our lives. And, and I do think we can appreciate that there's a cumulative damage that comes from little things that over time, like just sitting, you know, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with sitting. It's just over time, the excess sitting and the exposure to not moving and becoming more sedentary. There's that slow grind on our health and the toxins that are in our food do much the same thing. Well, that's right. Things like, like heavy metals. And this is all covered in the book. And by the way, if you don't mind me plugging, people can download the first section for free at foodforensics.com and you can just start to take a look at it. But uh, metals accumulate in your bones and your organs and even in your brain tissue and they replace healthy minerals and they start to cause dysfunction throughout your body. So that's one of the big ones. Well, yeah, there were a ton of heavy metals. And I think one of the things that kind of concerned me was that the USDA and the FDA don't have limits on these things like lead. They'll tell you, you, you have to buy pasteurized milk. You can't buy raw milk, but they, they won't tell you how much lead can be in your food, which I just Again, that kind of floored me. Well, yeah, and, and not only do they have no, no limits, really, but also the organic label in particular also has no limit and no required testing for heavy metals. So one of the concerning things that we found in our laboratory research with organics, and, and I'm pro-organics, by the way. This is not a criticism of organics. It's rather a warning to say, hey, guess what? Organics doesn't cover heavy metals. So we've seen some organic products that are very heavily contaminated and that, in my opinion, really violate the, the very premise of being organic. So a lot of people aren't aware of that. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I'm still going to I'm still going to keep in my heart of hearts that the organic is going to be better than the heavy fertilizers and some of the other things that they're doing 
with our food. So I'm, I'm still going to go organic. I'm still going to say go, go organic, but don't think you're 100% clean just because you're eating organic food. You know what the, the real secret of organics is? And I, I eat all organic, by the way, and I, I juice all organic every day, and I grow a lot of my own food food. But one of the biggest secrets of organic is checking the country of origin. Because what I found is that organic in North America, Canada, and Europe is very, very clean. But organic from China or India is often very contaminated. So the organic label is really not not the same on different continents. That's that's crucial to understand. Yeah. And I think another thing is when I'm shaking the hand of the gentleman that I'm buying vegetables from at the local um, farmer's market that they do each uh, Saturday, I know his family's eating those vegetables too. So he's he's taking care of the land and he's taking care of that. When he tells me where he grew that, he tells me how he grew that, I feel a lot more comfortable that I know where my food's coming from. So the closer it is from your home, the less they're going to have to do these kind of things. So as we kind of get into this, I wanted to talk about a few things that we deal with. And one what is a heavy metal and it's lead. And I think most people know that, that lead poisoning really can mess up children, but it, it has an impact on us across our entire lives. Well, absolutely. And it really affects bone health as we age. Lead tends to be deposited in our bones in place of calcium. And especially women, as they age and they undergo hormonal changes, they will often start to lose bone mineral density, which means their body is releasing that bone mass back into their blood. They can actually re-experience lead poisoning from decades earlier as their bones are breaking down. And lead poisoning damages kidneys. So you've got quite literally, some elderly women that are suddenly finding themselves with kidney damage or even on dialysis, not knowing why. And sometimes it can be traced back to extreme lead exposure from when they were in their 20s. And so basically, again, since the FDA and the USDA, they're not really going to put any limits on how much lead's in our food. We're going to get into the lifetime detox piece of this, but What's a good way for us just initially kind of off the top to avoid lead in our in our food? Well, let me bring in calcium. There's a warning and there's a benefit with calcium. Now, if you have a really good clean source of calcium, which by the way is plant-based calcium, and this is critical. The human body is not designed to absorb mineral calcium or what we call inorganic calcium when you're talking about chemistry. In other words, ground up rocks and seashells. The human body cannot really use that calcium, even though that's what's in a lot of the cheap calcium supplements. That calcium tends to be contaminated with lead. Sometimes I've seen as much as 5,000 parts per billion lead in calcium supplements that I purchased off the shelf. But if you have a really clean, good source of calcium from plants usually, and you can get that in things like spinach and broccoli, for example, all the green plants are loaded with calcium in an organic form that your body recognizes. The more you take in of plant-based calcium, the more it displaces the absorption of lead in your body. So a lot of these heavy metals, they are metals of opportunity. They will get into your body when you lack something else, like mercury, for example, can be displaced by zinc. So, you know, if you're lacking zinc, you'll tend to absorb more mercury. And the same relationship exists between lead and calcium as well. So now with with regards to, and this is something that I, I just, I cringe every time I see it. I walk into the break room and I see someone grab the, their plastic bowl, you know, that they've stored their food in the refrigerator. And they, they take the lid off of it, they put a paper towel over it, and they, they put it in the microwave and let it go for two or three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, my. And I just, yeah, I just, I'm like, you know, I, I okay, I don't want to be that guy that walks up to him and says, oh, by the way, you're poisoning yourself. But quite frankly, they are. BPA or, I mean, bis, bisphenol A, which is I just, BB, BPA is how I've seen it written in the literature, is a, is a real danger in the current chemicals of what makes up our uh, plasticware. Absolutely. And what's really interesting about BPA is that it's a hormone disruptor or a hormone mimicker. Now, hormones are biologically active in the human body at low parts per trillion concentrations, which means that they can alter your physiology at a million times lower concentrations than most heavy metals. So heavy metals tend to be toxic at parts per million, But these endocrine disruptors are toxic at parts per trillion, which, again, is a million times lower. So it doesn't take very much plastic to alter your hormones, believe it or not. And in women, this tends to cause breast cancer and reproductive organ cancers. And in men, 
it can also cause prostate cancers as well as interrupt male hormones, and it can actually cause some feminization of men by reducing the balance of, of testosterone and male hormones. So there's, there are a lot of really mysterious long-term effects from BPA exposure, and this is really just beginning to be uncovered in the science today. Yeah, and, and I think that's what's so scary to me is, you know, we can only do so much in the gym and we can only do so much with our food if we're getting these chemicals and they're disrupting the very instructions that our bodies operate, which is what hormones affect. I, I look at hormones and say those are instructions to tell your body how to operate, how to create energy, how to, you know, be male, how to be fa female, all the things that our body does are pretty much driven by these these hormones. And if we're doing things to our body, putting chemicals in our body, knowingly or unknowingly, they are disrupting the instruction manual that came with our body. And we're not going to operate efficiently. We're not going to operate effectively. And, and in many cases, we're going to cause ourselves a shorter, unhealthy life. I just want to say, you can, if, if you have a very healthy hormonal balance, let's say you're working out of the gym as a man and you're doing high-intensity exercise, you're generating mm -hmm. testosterone. If you're sleeping well at night and you don't have extraneous lights shining on you, then you're generating melatonin, another hormone, and you're getting good restful sleep. If you have healthy hormonal cycles that are well-established in your life, you can handle some exposure to BPA, and it's not going to, you know, kill you or, or you know, totally destroy your organs or whatever. But what it is, it, it preys on the vulnerable, people who are almost at a tipping point, people who are immunocompromised or they already suffer sleep disorders or sexual dysfunction disorders, low sperm counts, infertility. These kinds of things are symptoms of people who are right on that tipping point and exposure then to these hormone disruptors can really push them over over the edge into cancer or really systemic health problems. Well, you, you pretty much just described every human over the age of 40 that I've ever talked to that, you know, I mean, think about it, you know, we, we, we're, you know, we're going into the, the clinic for low T, such and such has thyroid issues, you know, they're, they're going into uh, menopause and dealing with, uh, you know, some estrogen issues. And so, you know, I think anyone over the age of 40 needs to be a little bit more hypersensitive about introducing these types of chemicals into their body because they are already somewhat compromised over how they were when they were in their 20s. Absolutely. And this, and in your 40s is where you really start to notice the difference of which path you choose. And the good news is, I, I think we're going to talk about this, is your body can actually remove these toxic elements on its own if you just give it the opportunity. That's kind of what I love about the human body is we, we were built to survive. If we, if we do the right things, we give ourselves the right tools our body can do amazing things. And yes, we, we are going to get to that. But I did want to talk about one more thing. And the reason that, that this one's really important to me is I used to have an addiction to Diet Coke. Uh -huh. You can ask anyone that knows me. I mean, when I talk about an addiction, it's funny because I'll, you know, I'll talk to someone, they'll see like, oh, I was drinking four cans a day. And I'm like, oh, okay, four cans, not bad. And then, you know, I have another person, oh, I was just eight cans. I'm like, okay, not too bad. You know, but that that was me is like thinking, oh, you know, okay, so you're eating, drinking a six pack a day. I was drinking up to three liters of Diet Coke a day. Wow. You know, so <laughs> three to four sometimes. And, and, you know, just depending on what was going on, it was, you know, it was my caffeine source, it was my energy source, it's my when I'm bored, what I drink. It's, you know, just all day, every day from wake up to, you know, go to bed. And over the years, I, I, I had people hop harping on me, you know, you need to do something about this. You need to do something about this. And it, it really was kind of when I, the light came on was when I realized that I was, you know, I was starting to do a lot of right things in my life and I was starting to see some health benefits, but I just recognized that there were, that I wasn't getting what I needed. I was, you know, my body wasn't functioning the way that it needed to, to grow, to be strong. I, I knew something I do. I was doing something wrong and I quit Diet Coke, which was probably the hardest thing that I've ever done as far as, I mean, you know, I've probably done a lot of hard things. Like I've run 50 mile races and, you know, was in the army and military. So I've done a lot of hard things, but for me to say quitting Diet Coke was the hardest thing I ever did is, is actually now a true statement. There's a chemical, a sweetener in Diet Coke that is what I think was part of the addiction, part of the problem. Could you go in a little bit into aspartame? and what that does to us and, and, and what, what it's all about. Well, sure. I, I think, in my opinion, as a scientist and a researcher, I think aspartame is one of the most insidious dietary poisons that 
that is widely consumed across America today. And it's because it's consumed in those large amounts like you just alluded to. Many people are doing this. And there are so many problems associated with aspartame. It, it generates the bulk of food ingredient side effect claims to the FDA, for example, or complaints. That is, chemically, it breaks down into things like formic acid, which is uh, you know, a toxin. But the other thing that's going on when you're drinking diet soda, you may be avoiding the corn syrup and the sugar by, by using diet forms uh, with aspartame, but you're not avoiding the phosphoric acid and the carbonation, which is also acidic. So when you're consuming diet sodas, you're actually you're drinking highly, a highly acidic substance, and that causes a cascade of detrimental health effects throughout your body as your body attempts to adjust to, to buffering that pH with more alkaline solutions and minerals in your body which includes your skeletal system, by the way. That's where your body finds a lot of alkaline minerals like calcium and magnesium. So aspartame itself, yeah, needs to be avoided for life in my opinion, but it's also all that carbonation and heavy, heavy acidity that's consumed in large quantities. You know, frankly, we should be drinking water or perhaps green tea as our primary hydration source. It shouldn't be a sugar beverage. It shouldn't even be a cane juice sweetened protein drink nor should it be a carbonated acid source such as Diet Coke. It should be water or something very, very close to water. Well, now I know, you know, having, having now gone off of, of Diet Coke for over a year, I, I've recognized what it was doing to my body. And, and, and another thing it was that, I, that it was doing personally for me is it, it, it raised up my taste buds to basically want sweeter foods. Ah, uh, yes. You know, so I was compelled to want sweeter foods, to want, you know, sugar in this or, you know. And so when I kind of switched over, I said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to start trying to drink black coffee. And I literally couldn't drink black coffee because my sweet taste just told me that this was way, way too bitter. So I tricked myself by sitting there with a little bit of fruit and I would sip some coffee and eat a little bit of fruit. And I did that for probably the first two or three weeks that I was drinking coffee. And then I just slowly tapered off the fruit to a point where now I only drink black coffee uh, and green and unsweet green tea. And those are pretty much, if I'm going to drink a caffeinated beverage, that's, that's what I go for. And then the rest of the day, it's water or maybe a kombucha every once in a while. You make a really good point, And that is that these, these processed foods distort our natural taste balance. And it's not just about sweetness because everything is so intensely sweet, but really there are only three main flavors that the factory food companies push onto us. And it's salty, you know, salt, sweet, or fat. And if you think about most of the junk foods and the snack foods, that's all they are. They're just combinations of fat, you know, fried chips with salt or something sweet, or sometimes intensely salty or super salty sweet, you know, extreme this and extreme that. And where that leads is, is to exactly what you described, a situation where we can no longer enjoy or even in some cases taste normal, healthy, wholesome food. And that is, at that point, you've crossed a, you know, a tipping point. Maybe, not you in particular, I mean your listeners, any of us. We've crossed a tipping point to where we are now isolated from nature. We're isolated from the foods that we're designed to consume. And that is a bad place to be. And I think that's why it's, it's really difficult sometimes for people to go into a whole food diet because as they get into it, it, it literally tastes bland because they've, they've built up that taste threshold, I guess, for a lack of a better term, to where they've been able now. So, but if you stick with it, it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, again, the body's so adaptable, which is what I, what I love about it is we can kind of regain the ability to taste whole food if we just go ahead and start eating it and then get past that kind of barrier. Well, that's right. That's right. It's just like if you go to a concert and your ears are blasted at, at 105 decibels, you know, you're going to be partially deaf for the next few days and you're not going to be able to hear the subtleties of conversation or, or more enjoyable music and so on. But eventually your senses come back to their senses and you're able to enjoy the subtleties again. And that's, that's where, you know, healthy eating actually is very enjoyable because your senses are tuned in to the diverse textures and tastes that represent all of the healing phytochemicals or plant-based nutrients that are found throughout foods. You know, a lot of people who don't eat healthy, they have a misconception thinking that eating healthy is, is hard and it doesn't taste good and it's difficult and that their, their junk 
junk foods are more enjoyable. That's a myth. But you don't realize that until you get rid of the junk foods and get onto real, actual, healthy, nutritious, wholesome foods. I know I, I can sit down now and I can literally take, you know, two or three cups of, of kale or spinach or arugula and literally just put a little bit of olive oil on it and a little bit of apple cider vinegar and I'm, I'm in heaven. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but it took me a while to get there. You know, it wasn't just sitting there saying, I'm going to eat this day one. It literally was, okay, I know I need to eat a salad because I need the calcium. I need those nutrients. And, you know, this is going to be a good meal for me today. And then I, I would eat it and, and not really enjoy it as much. And now I actually look forward to my, my big salad. So, you know, I, I think that that's what I really like about, you know, again, the human body just has this ability, if we give it the tools and the opportunity to be better, to get better. Everybody can get better if they just make an effort to take one step at a time and try to be better tomorrow. And so you have something in your book, you, you kind of refer to it as a lifetime detox. And I, I'd like to briefly get into that because I think that's a that's a good concept for folks to understand is that you can't go through a weekend and say, oh, I'm detox, so now I'm good. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they sell them, they sell that. It's like 72-hour detox, take this powder, put it in your water, you know, you're good. And I kind of just laugh at them every time I see it. It's like, no, it's it's a lifestyle. It's it's not really that. But but can you kind of get into your uh, your approach here? Yeah, well, just like the factory food companies have, you know, extreme nachos, some dietary supplement companies that I, I disagree with have been pushing for many, many years these sort of extreme detox supplements. And I, I, I vehemently disagree with that approach. And I think some of them are even dangerous. And it comes down to the idea that, that many people think that it's, it's a no pain, no gain type of situation. They've been taught that in order for a detox to be, quote, working, then they have to be experiencing cramps and diarrhea or vomiting or sweating or rashes or all kinds of things. Well, it turns out that many of those things are caused by the supplement they're taking. There are ingredients that are put into these supplements that are designed to cause diarrhea. If you're not getting any cleaner, you're just torturing yourself because it feels better when you stop. And, and pooping a lot, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not a detox. So my advice is to consider every meal a detox. I mean, if, if you think about it, your body is manufacturing new blood cells every second of every hour of every day. And you're, you're eliminating old blood cells every day through your urine, mostly through your urine. Hopefully that's where it's going. And what are your new blood cells made of? Well, think about it. Those new blood cells are circulating everywhere. They're, they're fueling your brain and your heart and your lungs, you know, your, your reproductive organs, your muscles, everything, your skin. And those blood cells are made of the things you ate and drank over the last 24 hours. So every day you have an opportunity to change your blood, which changes your health and changes your life. It even changes your moods because your brain is bathed in your blood. Right? And if your blood is junk blood because you ate junk food, then you're going to get junk thoughts and junk moods and junk performance. You're going to have cognitive impairment or mood swings or anger or depression. But if you eat incredibly power, em empowering superfoods, you're going to have super performance because you're going to have super blood. Or, or I, don't even, I don't even know if the word super is correct. It's just going to be normal, healthy blood, which creates normal, healthy moods, normal, healthy cognitive function, which goes along with creativity, innovation learning capabilities, ability to, to socialize, all these things start with what you eat. So you're detoxing with every meal and your body is eliminating every day. And that's awesome. And, you know, and, I, and I, I do say, okay, start building that. Start thinking about how you want to be tomorrow and, and then taking steps today to, to start making that happen. And, and, you know, and we can't all be like we were when we were 29 tomorrow, but we can take one step in that direction if we just change the food, like you said, hit the gym. So, you know, we're, we're building the testosterone, get good sleep. So, you know, we're, we're getting the hormone balances, all those things. So we're not vulnerable to a lot of these issues and, and by all means, please clean up your food. You know, you, you've hit on something there, Alan. It's a great question it would be to ask yourself, how do I wish to feel tomorrow? When you're looking in the refrigerator or shopping at the grocery store to ask yourself that very cognizant question. How do I wish to feel and perform tomorrow? Because that should determine what I eat now. But instead, most people in our society today choose to eat and drink based on entertainment value. 
It's solely an entertainment experience. How is this going to make my tongue feel, my taste feel, the texture in my mouth, the sweetness, you know, the, the fun of the chocolate cake and the pudding? It's an entertainment mindset, which is really, frankly, and I don't don't mean to be insulting to anyone, but it's an infantile mindset. That's the way it's okay to function when you're five or six years old. But we are 40 plus year old adults. We should be thinking strategically how we wish to perform, not how to turn our mouths into an amusement park. Yeah. And, and I, I like the word perform because for, you know, coming from an athletic background, we, we, we thought about what we were doing as a form of performance. But I would say, you know, even if you're not an athlete, performance is just living day to day. So how do you wish to live? You know, how, how do you wish to perform? I love that. Yeah. That, I mean, if you think about it, all of us, we, we live in a stressful world, a stressful era for humanity. We have many, many demands on our time, on our ability to make decisions. You know, you cannot perform at a high level if you're living on junk nutrition and, and you're contaminated with toxic heavy metals and all these poisons in the food. So if you look at the most successful people in society today, I think you will find a very strong trend towards what we call conscious eating, which is deliberately choosing the inputs into your body that maximize your performance. That's awesome, Mike. So again, I really appreciate you. You brought a lot of value, and this is this is a really good book to learn about what's in your food, what it means to your body, and and how you can get get better if you if you're dealing with these things. So if if I wanted to send them somewhere where they could learn more, where would you want me to send them? Very simple. Foodforensics.com is the book website, and uh, there they can check out the book. They can see a trailer video that we posted. And uh, you can you can download the first chapter, but I've also got good news. The publisher has greenlighted now a second book that I've started researching. So next year we'll have food forensics. Uh, it's called the uh, the pesticide files, and we'll be documenting the pesticide levels in different foods. And check this out. No one's ever done this. We're gonna we're gonna compare the pesticides on the apple peel versus the apple meat. We're going to check the outsides of the fruits and vegetables versus the insides and publish those numbers. No one's ever done that. And we've all had this question, right? Yeah. Well, there's no money in, in the science of that other than, again, publishing a book. So congratulations. And I do hope you'll come back so we can learn more about that and, and what you find. I'm thrilled to come back. I'd love to join you anytime. And uh, even to talk about exercise, you know, 40 plus fitness. I'm an active guy. I live on a ranch in Texas. I'm 49 years old and uh, staying healthy and active. So love to share that with you anytime. Oh, great. So if you want to learn more, you want to get those links, just go to older.fitness forward slash 140. This is episode 140. And with that, Mike, I'll let you go. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I don't know about you, but I'm really glad there's people like Mike Adams that are taking the time to look at our food and give us a better understanding of what we're doing, what we're eating. And I really do encourage you to get his book, Food Forensics. It's an awesome guide, an awesome opportunity for you to learn a lot about the food that we eat. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, I talk about functional fitness, what it is, and how you should be incorporating it in your programming. Until then, have a happy and healthy day. <music> <music>